Hey piano people, today we're gonna talk about five things to know about playing octaves on the piano. Make sure to stick with me to the end and let's get your octaves sounding better, feeling more comfortable, and let me help you learn how to practice them. I'm gonna be demonstrating octaves with the Rigoletto Paraphrase by Franz Liszt. It's one of my all-time favorite pieces, and if you wanna hear me play the whole entire thing, I'll link to a performance in the description below. It's a piece that I've come back to off and on throughout my entire piano career because I love it. It's one of my absolute favorite pieces. It's full of drama and it's full, as you can see, of octaves. Now octaves come up a lot in piano music and they come up in a bunch of different contexts and so I'm going to try to cover as many of those contexts as I can throughout these five different points because sometimes we hear them played super staccato and fast, sometimes we hear them played really slow and legato and of course every combination in between. So we want to make sure that we have the techniques and the basic principles to address all kinds of octaves. So the first thing that I want you to think about when you are working with octaves is fingering. Fingering can be really tricky, but it can really make or break your success when playing octaves. And depending on the piece and also the articulation that is required, you might consider using different fingerings. One of the basic principles of octaves is that whenever you are on the white keys, you wanna be using one and five. Whenever you are on the black keys, you wanna be using one and four. And you can go back and forth between the two. Changing fingers from one and five to one and four is really helpful because it helps you to not have tension in your hand. Often in piano, tension is the result of a static or of a lack of movement. And so when we're switching between five and four, that can really help our hand to move and change just enough that we don't have that static energy, which causes tension. So in the regular little paraphrase, if I just show you this little example, in measure 75, where I have a lot of repeated octaves, I start on a C and then I go to an E flat. And so I have a couple of different options here. On the C, I'm definitely gonna use one and five, but when I go up to the E flat, I can either stay with one and four for the entire time, or I can try to do it with one and five the entire time, or I can do it with one and four and then switch to one and five. So let me show you the options and the pros and cons with each. And obviously the downfall of that is that when I get to the E flat, playing on my pinky up there repeatedly is very unstable. It doesn't feel very comfortable possible, but it's difficult. So that's why I like to switch to one and four on the black keys. So let's start with one and five, and then we switch to one and four. Let's try that. Now then we have some hybrid options where I can start with one and five and I can go to one and four and switch to one and five. Let's see that. I do like that one because again, it adds a little more movement in there, which helps to prevent that tension. But my favorite here is actually just to stay with one and five on the white keys, one and four on the black keys. And I actually use my third finger as kind of an anchor with the one and four, and I'll show you what I mean here. So I'm on one and five, I go to one and four, but my third finger, you can see, is really right next to that fourth finger. In fact, I'm almost using both to play that octave. And it helps me to voice out this top note. And it also helps me to ensure that I don't slide off of the keys, which is one of the most common things that happens when you're playing black keys. Now that section of music is repeated octaves that are going really quick and they're 30 second notes, so they're more or less staccato. Now another option for octaves is that we have two note slur octaves, which are especially challenging because we have to make them legato, which is really hard when we're stretching our hand so far. But here in measure 71 of this piece, you can see that I have these two notes slur octaves. And so what I'm going to do there is I'm going to be really clever and I'm going to play again the white keys with one and five, but I'm going to hold the pinky on that top note as I use one and three for the black keys. So let me show you that really slowly. So you can see that I can come down, I can hold the pinky, and I can come over with one and three to the E flat and play that. Now that one is especially challenging, but if you can practice really slowly, counting out loud with the metronome, like less than half tempo, you'll be able to slowly work it up. And I'll cover some other tips on how to practice these octaves a little bit later in the video. Now, lastly, if we wanna play legato octaves, it's not always possible to play every single octave in a row legato, but we can do our very best. So we wanna use fingers alternating between one and five, one and four, one and three, or any combination thereof. And we wanna hold down the top note while we lift the bottom note to get to the next octave. Similarly to what I was doing with the two note slur, but obviously you would be slurring a longer chain of notes. And so you would just continue on with that same technique. Now, the second thing we wanna think about when we are trying to play octaves on the piano is technique. 
We want to check in with our piano posture, with our breathing, with our alignment, and make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success with the octaves. If I'm slouching, if I'm sitting back on the bench, if I'm not right there over the keys, the chances of me technically executing something correctly when there's octaves involved is pretty small. So I have a ton of videos about piano posture. I'll link those in the description below. But essentially, you want to make sure that you're sitting up nice and tall. You want to make sure that you're sitting on the edge of your bench, that you've got your feet planted nice and firm, and that you have space to to lean over the keys and really be able to move around with flexibility. I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna say that octaves are probably the most challenging thing to play if you're not sitting in the proper piano alignment. All right, the third thing that we wanna think about is movement. And I, I talked a little bit about this in point one when I was talking about fingering, but we wanna make sure that we are moving in a way that supports our success with the octaves. And so the movement that you choose, again, will be a little bit dependent on what kind of octaves you're doing and how they're showing up in the music. But a couple of things that we wanna keep in mind, when we're playing octaves, those of us that have smaller hands generally can't play a lot of octaves in a row without tension. And so we need to do some things to counterbalance that. So the first thing, and you might have noticed this when I was playing, is that my wrist is up like this, which I don't recommend always because it can create a lot of tension, but occasionally we need to do it to, to span the hand larger. So if I keep my wrist perfectly straight, my, my hand can reach about that far from my thumb to my pinky, but if I lift my wrist, all of the sudden, you can see that that range expands. So I don't wanna keep my hand in this position for very long, because I can actually instantly feel that it's a little bit tense, but I can put my wrist up like that to increase my range that I can reach on the keyboard, and then I can make sure that in addition to this, I'm adding some other movements in. So the number one thing to think about is to stay loose. So you can see my wrist is up, I'm ready to play these octaves, but also watch what happens when I start playing. You can see that my hand is flapping. And I sometimes joke around and I call this the hand flap because it's completely loose. I did not raise my wrist and tense up. It would be impossible to play octaves that way. I raised my wrist a little bit to increase that range and I instantly relaxed the rest of my hand so that I could do those very fast flapping motions. Now the other thing that we can think about is something that we do a lot in other kinds of piano playing where we want our wrist to be flexible and to go up and down. So when I'm playing many octaves in a row, I can think about choreographing a motion to capture all of the octaves. So for example, when I have four repeated note octaves in a row, I can start down low and play all four while my wrist goes up. Or I can start up high and I can play all four as my wrist goes down. So my wrist is starting down and going up or my wrist is starting up and going down I personally like starting down and going up. It just feels more natural to me, but both are an option. And this idea of actually choreographing how you're going to move when you're trying to play octaves that are technically challenging is really smart. And I actually write it in my music because it ensures that I'm not getting tense. Now, a great way to get in touch with your body and with what's going on and with where you're tense and where you're loose is to practice different points of motion. And you can do this with octaves, you can do this with chords, you can do this with different kinds of staccato as well. And it's something that my teacher taught me in grad school and it's a really great way to tune in to where the movement is coming from. The first thing that I like to do is to try to practice a repeat of octave or any pattern of octaves just with the fingers. And this is an example of how we don't want to play. So we just take our fingers and we move our fingers along. And you can see that the rest of my arm, my wrist is stiff, my elbow is stiff, my shoulder is stiff. It's just my fingers that are moving can't do very much like that because it's really uncomfortable and I don't have a lot of movement and flexibility. Then I'm gonna try just letting my wrist be really loose and letting the motion come from the wrist. This is like a bouncing motion in my wrist. And you can see that my wrist is moving around. This feels really natural to me. This is one of my most favorite ways to play octaves. But then to help myself tune in even more, I'm gonna practice from the elbow, really exaggerated. So now you can see it's a big motion that's coming all from my elbow. And then I'm gonna practice with the entire weight of my arm kind of coming from my shoulder. And you can see with that last one, there's a lot of movement there. What's gonna happen when you start to practice this way is one, you're gonna become 
acutely aware of exactly where the movement in your body is happening. And two, you're going to start to become familiar with those different techniques because really we want to utilize all of them at different points, except for maybe the playing with the fingers. That's not really one that you ever need to utilize, but sometimes you'll need to move from the wrist, sometimes from the elbow. And occasionally if you're trying to play really loud octaves, you might need that whole entire arm involved. And so tuning into those different points can be a really great way to check in with movement and where that movement is happening and where it's coming from and where there's tension if there is tension so that you can hopefully release that. Now let me know if these techniques help you or not. I want to know what you're struggling with in your octaves. Comment below the piece that you're working on and what you're struggling with and I hope this video addresses it and if not I'm happy to reply to your comments and help you out as much as I can. All right the fourth thing that we're going to talk about is voicing. I'm going to say 95% of the time in piano music when you're playing octaves the melody is going to be the top note of the octave. There will be some times when that is not true and if you're playing something like that and you're watching this video and you're like what is she talking about that is not true then you you can comment below and let me know what piece you're playing. There are definitely exceptions to that, but the wide majority of octaves have the melody note on the top. And so we always want to practice throwing the weight into that top note so that it's voiced. When we think about trying to play both notes exactly evenly, what's funny and seems counterintuitive is that usually it sounds really uneven. Whereas when we think of the weight going into that top note, and I actually practice this motion of like going towards that top note, then all of a sudden it becomes much more even because we have something to focus on. A certain part of our hand is leading and that makes it a lot easier to play. I have an entire video on voicing and I talk about how to practice that in more detail, so I'll link that in the description below. The fifth thing to know about playing octaves on the piano is how to practice them. And there's a lot of different ways to practice them and I already talked about a couple, but the number one point I want you to take away from this video is that octaves are not something that you can just bust out usually. Even professionals need to practice octaves consistently over periods of time before they can execute them properly. Like when I'm going to play the, the list Rigoletto paraphrase, that is not a piece that I can just sit down and play. I have to practice it a couple of days in a row and I have to drill those octaves. And it used to be that I had to practice it for like a couple of months in a row before I could perform it. Octaves are something that if you're really actively working on them, they're going to get better and better and they'll get easier. But if you take a break and you're working on pieces that don't have any octaves and you're not working on that technique, it doesn't go away completely but it's not right there at the forefront of your muscle memory and so you will have to continue to work on it each time that you want to play a piece that has challenging octaves in it. So I'm going to give you a couple of my favorite practice techniques specifically for octaves. So the first one is to practice the different parts of the octaves individually and this is really 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 hard to do but it's very beneficial. So with this little section in the list Rigoletto Paraphrase I can practice all of the thumbs on their own like this. pick a small section of the music, maybe a measure or two at a time, and I would do it with the metronome and I would count it out loud and I would be very methodical about it to ensure that I was practicing the bottom part of the octave as I ultimately wanted it to sound in the music. And then I would do the same thing for the top part of the octave, which is really hard because you have to make sure that you're doing it with the proper fingering. If I'm switching between four and five and occasionally there's a third finger in there, I have to know that and I have to actually practice it that way or it's going to defeat the entire purpose of practicing it this way at all. And again, slowly counting with the metronome, you know, methodically so that you get it accurate. And then you would, of course, put those together. And you can do this practice every day because it's going to help you get so much more confident with the spacing and the jumps between the octaves and also with the specific notes that you're playing. Now, if these tips are helpful, go ahead and hit the thumbs up so that other people can find this video as well. And if you're liking my channel, please subscribe so that you can stay up to date with all of my tips and tricks. Now another thing that I like to do with octaves is I like to group them. And this kind of goes along with what I was saying before about choreographing the motion. You can think of them in different chunks and you can count them that way. And this can get a little confusing because it's not exactly the same as counting the rhythm, but it's to help you get used to what you're doing with the octave. So for example, in that section that I was showing you, I think of it as one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, because that's the pattern that's repeating throughout the entire piece. So it's one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four. And so it's really important that before I put those octaves in the context of the whole piece, that I know what's happening in those little tiny sections or those little tiny groupings. Eventually, once I got more comfortable, 
and I was playing it a little bit faster. Then I started counting them in six. One, two, three, four, five, 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 six. And that helped a lot. And then eventually I put them back into the context of the entire piece and I knew what beats were where and I knew where they lined up in the context of the rhythm of the piece. Some additional things that you can do to practice would be to do octaves in rhythms, to do octaves with flash practice, and to make sure that you work on your jumps technique. So practicing with your eyes closed, measuring out all of the jumps, all of that kind of stuff. So I have a video that talks in detail about how to practice jumps. It's an old video, so don't judge me on the quality of it. The content is still very, very much applicable. I'll link that in the description below. And then for flash practice and rhythms practice, go ahead and watch my video that's all about how to practice in those ways, and you can do that right here.